All right. Is it good? Okay, hey, we are back. Wow. <laughs> this is this is funny and fun at the same time. We we kind of got used to it doing live technical difficulty. Bless bless the system, bless the Lord. All right. So anyway, we are um, back online right now and hopefully uh, you can hear me and if you can hear me you know just write something down you know and at the same time I know this is going to be um, like on Facebook live so if you're from uh, like a different country because we are from Singapore we are from if you're from outside Singapore please do a shout out you know share your nation where you're coming from we, we love to greet you we love to say hi all right, I know, uh, oh, Carol from US. Hi, Carol, awesome. All right, we, we do want to greet everybody, you know. So if you are tuning in for the first time, this is our Supernatural School that we have uh, every Thursday night, you know. Uh, so if you're in America, it's probably a different timing, but it's every Thursday night for us at 7.30 p.m. And we are calling this series called The Soak Living Room, whereby, as you can see, I am... Um, sitting really comfortably in a couch you know so this is what we call a soap living room we just sit around with social distancing <laughs> yeah which is which is helpful because you know uh this is we want to be responsible citizen all right but basically the heart of it is just kind of sit around you know I, what i would miss is actually if there's a fireplace but i you know singapore is so hot <laughs> You know, I'm just missing my time in US where there's a fireplace in winter and everyone just kind of sit around the fireplace sharing stories, drinking a cup of hot chocolate. So that, would, that would be so nice. But anyway, Singapore is really hot. There's no fireplace. Today, weather was so hot. I think I was in a fireplace. <laughs> so anyway, a warm welcome. All right. I uh, see someone from, um, let me see, from the UK. Hello. From Philippines. Hey, hi to you. All right, let me see who else. Uh, someone from um, China. Hi to you. Awesome. Awesome. All right, so we're very excited. So anyway, we are right now on this uh, series and topic on cultivating a revivalist lifestyle. You know, and I think like over the past few weeks, we, we talk about a different aspect of how a revivalist lifestyle look like, you know, the environment. And I think we share some uh, pretty heartfelt stories at the same time. You know, we were being really authentic and raw in, 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 along the way, you know. So, um, I don't want to jump in today, but I kind of like uh, opening up a totally, uh, totally brand new uh, kind of subject, all right. You know, I think our heart, uh, two of us have this heart, is this like, um, revival, you know, or the move of God, it's not just supposed to be within and confined by the four walls of the church, you know. Uh, I think re re revival, you know, so, so for me it is, sometimes it's not about waiting for revival, it's rather changing our mindset is that I am revival. You know, I am revival. I'm not waiting for, God is, God is not, uh, I'm not waiting for God to move. God is actually waiting for me to move because the kingdom of God is really within me. So wherever I go, the potential uh, to, to, to release heaven on earth is there, you know. And I think we kind of touched a lot about that, but I think tonight we really want to talk about like what does it look like uh, to see you know a move of God, revival, you know, or the supernatural being manifested outside the uh, four walls of the church. Because a lot of times you know we have healing conferences, but it is only for people who attend the conference. We have prophetic conferences, but it's only for people who attend um, the prophetic conference, and and it's kind of confined in a sense. You know, I, I'm just going to uh, throw these questions to Patrick to kind of let him uh, start the ball rolling. All right. But before that, hey, I forgot to introduce Patrick. <laughs> I'm just been talking, but hey, let me introduce Patrick first. If you're uh, tuning in first, you know, Patrick, say hi to everybody. Say, tell, tell the world something they don't know about you. Huh? <laughs> I don't know. Hello. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's good to be back. Uh, I don't know what to say, you know. Uh, say something, something fun. Something, fun, something <laughs> fun about you. Something fun about me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. There's, yeah. There's, there's nothing I can think of that is fun about. Oh, me. bro, bro! Oh. I know so many fun things about you. Jeff also knows so many fun things about you. Hmm. 
All right, never mind. I'm going to pass the time to Jeff. All right, we're going to welcome uh, Jeff. And Jeff, say hi uh, to everyone. Oh, wow. Hi, everyone. Uh, glad to have you. This is our fifth session. And uh, we're going to dive into, I mean, the, in the first few sessions, we actually uh, talk about community. We talk about um, the character of a revivalist. We come talk about um, why sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard, and why, and uh, this, uh, yeah, it's not, it, revival is, is not an easy lifestyle, yeah, the, uh, salvation is free, but uh, yeah, going to heaven is a done deal, how much heaven you want to see here, there is, uh, yeah, and you, that one you need to contend mm. for, Come on. yeah, because not a lot of people want, uh, a lot of us want an evacuation, uh, but God is looking for an invasion mm -hmm. of His goodness, an invasion of the presence of God, uh, of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, you know what? It, it doesn't take a lot to evacuate. Yeah, it actually takes very little effort to evacuate. You just walk out. But uh, it, it takes more effort to invade. It brings the culture of heaven here. Come on. Because, uh, yeah, and... and uh, and that that is essential because that's what the Lord wants. Your kingdom come, your will be done oh. on earth as it's in heaven. And He wants you to take the point of reference of how earth looks like to heaven's eyes. And uh, that requires you to stand in the middle to kind of take the reference of every situation, every economic crisis, every person that you see from a heaven's reference point. And that, that, that that needs you to be in a standing in a gap in, in between. Uh, so we call that intercession. Uh, Western Dictionary calls intercessor as a, a relevant to stand in between two parties for the purpose of reconciliation. That's what we are. That's why we have the Ministry of Reconciliation. And a lot of us, uh, I don't think that it's just only for people. It's reconciling heaven on earth. Uh, yes, we have been given a ministry of reconciliation. Uh, yes, that majority deals with bringing people to reconcile with God. But it's also a ministry of reconciliation that earth used to look like Eden. And when we got saved, when we, the Holy Spirit lived in us, and when God says the kingdom, when Jesus says the kingdom of God is in you, it's up to us to make earth look like Eden. And uh, and we, we, we become that transaction point. The trans, uh, you you are the landing strip of heaven's activity. It might might say that you are where heaven's traffic and activity kind of like uh, you are you are you are the traffic light. Whether you put a red light and says I'm going to evacuate, or you put a green light and says I want more of heaven here, and I want to be that transaction point between heaven and earth and. Uh, that's a decision. So, uh, you know what? If you are evacuating and you think that like uh, the earth is going to get bad and you have no desire to change it, this lesson is not for you, really. This lesson <laughs> is not for you. I'm just honestly saying. But uh, uh, you know what? The, the goodness, the, at the end of the Bible, we win. At the end of the Bible, and they talk about this kingdom, this new Jerusalem that is coming, it's going to heal the earth. Mm. So, yeah, and, and uh, uh, it's, we want to live earth. When, when, when we live earth, we want to see the earth looks more like heaven. That's, 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 that's the goal. So, uh, yeah, um, so we're going to dive into, in the next two sessions, we're going to dive into... Um, Revival in different places, marketplace, how does it look like, uh, schools, how does it look like. And so we're going to share st stories and stuff, so it will be more interactive and it's more fun. Uh, yeah, you hear a lot of uh, yeah. testimonies and it's good because um, uh, testimony is part of impartation. And I can tell you how many times when I hear a testimony of a person, it's not me saying, how I wish I could do that. Uh, and... and before we start this ball rolling in this next uh, this week and next week of sharing testimonies of how God moves in different places, uh, 
how I got impartation from people's testimony was the first thing uh, that I don't ask is how I wish I could be like that. Yeah. I never asked that. I actually asked the opposite. It says, if he has the Holy Spirit and he can do that, my response is, be, wow, I didn't know I can do that. Yeah. So instead of jealous of another person's uh, success, uh, we look at another person's testimony and says, whoa, you mean the Holy Spirit through him can do that? That means the Holy Spirit through me can do that too. So then we are not, um, we're, we're, we're not sharing testimonies to cause you to be absent from an inheritance. We are sharing a testimony so that you can partake together because we share the same spirit. We are connected to the same inheritance. We are in a joint heir. Joint heir has a joint account. Have you ever realized that? Uh, 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 process. We are joint heir in Christ. That means joint heirs have a joint family account. So if this person or if Patrick can pull from the family account and heal 10 lame people, I mean not lame jokes, although he do a lot of lame jokes, but lame people, <laughs> that means I need to look at what he's sharing and say, wow, because it's a joint account, what he do, I can do so because we are sharing from the same account. And most of the time, we don't see testimonies that way. Because when someone shares testimony, or Heidi Baker shares testimonies, and it's really awesome. So, and the first thing that you come to mind is how I wish I could be like them. <laughs> that was, if you think that way, you already disqualify yourself. Uh, but see the testimony as a joint account in, in Jesus. And so whatever she can tap in, Patrick tap in, Kevin tap in, or I tap in, it's the same way that you also can tap into it because we are a joint account, yeah? We are a joint account of a, Heaven's joint account is full of billions of sons and daughters. Yeah. It's just whether you want to withdraw or you don't want to withdraw. That's the main thing. And when we share all these testimonies, right, it's also telling you that it's available for withdrawal. If you don't go to the bank, to withdraw what we tell you you have, that is not God's problem and that is not our problem. Yeah, may the testimony give you faith to withdraw from the bank account of heaven in the name of Jesus, even in these few weeks. That we are sharing testimonies so that you can, we can, sh sh you can share the same account and realize that this shared account yeah. has so much involved. So uh, I, I just want to say that before we begin so um no that's that's good uh, back to who yep that, that, that's good jeff uh I, I really love that you started talking about testimony being impartation because that's actually something that uh, i love to talk about because i think people always he, uh, see testimony as just a praise report and they will hear with their ears clap their hands and the life move on you know but, but I don't want to kind of see what is the spiritual dynamic when a testimony is being shared. You see, this is what I believe. When, when someone shares a testimony, th that, that's, uh, that's almost like an a, a, a open heaven. You know, that's almost like a, like, like a spiritual realm opens up. And, and grace is being released when you lean into the testimony. So, so I always uh, kind of encourage people, don't just listen to testimony, feast on them. You know, because one, one, one one good thing about testimony is that they actually expand our logical mind. <laughs> they expand our mind. Because usually we, uh, we only know God can do all these things through the Bible and through testimony. So for example, you know, if you know that God can heal the sick, and suddenly you hear testimony of people getting healed from cancer, now it expands your mind. God doesn't just heal back, back aches, neck pain, you know, but God can heal cancer. You know, and, and that's kind of what happened to me when I started hearing of kids with special needs getting healed. And that, that just kind of like expanded my mind, you know. So I, I started to really go after those breakthroughs because something in, in my spirit like expanded and shifted. I would say testimony creates hunger. Or in another way, testimony increase your appetite for the impossible. Yeah. That this is this is the word of the Lord. I just feel that that's a good word. <laughs> testimony that when you hear testimony, it should increase your appetite for the impossible. You know, because if you hear testimony and it doesn't, 
and it doesn't increase your appetite for the impossible. <laughs> You know, and then it just means you're just hearing testimony. You're not meditating on testimony. You're not feasting on testimony. And I'm gonna, uh, man, this is such a good word. It just came, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna preach this again another time. But hey, testimony should increase your appetite for the impossible. You know, so so like I really feel that to, tonight and next week, you know, we will share a lot of different story where you know, uh, the move of God, you know, the supernatural happen outside the four walls of church, and how. We should uh, see that as a lifestyle, as something that should happen every day, you know. So I, I'm gonna uh, pass this time to uh, Patrick to kind of uh, talk talk more about it. All right, uh, Patrick, feel free to add on to uh, what we have uh, shared just now. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so Monday I was at the clinic. You know, I was accompanying uh, a. P- a, a patient who is uh, treating her cancer, treating cancer at a clinic. And then the nurse walked in and the, the nurse had a cast on her hand. I don't know, she's, uh, she's a Korean nurse from Korea. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I asked, oh, uh, oh, what happened to you? you know, uh, do you still have pain? And, and she said, yeah, it's still painful. And so I said, um, oh, let me take a look. And so I, I, uh, I reached out my hand and, and put my hand over her hand with, with her, uh, the cast. It's, it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not the cast cast, you know, it's like a plastic type of uh, support. support. Support, is it? Yeah, that you know, uh, that she can actually remove. <laughs> so I, I put my hand just over her hand and I release, release presence. All right. And uh, she started to feel sensation over her hand. I, I asked her to check it out, and uh, she took out her, her support. And her hand actually felt better, you know, uh, her hand actually felt more relaxed. And, and so uh, notice I did, I, what I did w- was um, I, I said the word, I, I, I said the sentence, um, can, can I take a look, right? I did not say, uh, can I pray for you, All right? Um, and this is what I usually do out of a church setting. You know, if I, if I see someone, uh, that is in a cast, uh, and if it is like, uh, it, it, it is like, uh, suitable, you know, opportunity to just approach the person and just, uh, ask how, you know what what happened? You no, know, I do it. Yeah, so I uh, I've done it a number of a number of times, not only in Singapore, but in other countries. And uh, yeah, so so the, so the thing is, I do it in a way that does that minimizes uh, the person from feeling uncomfortable. Yeah, because if. <laughs> You know, straight away out of the blue, I I said, "Oh, oh, you you got injury? Can I pray for you?" <laughs> you know, like uh, it is it, is going to freak people out. Yeah, half the time. <laughs> so we can we 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 can really reach out to people in in ways that are. Uh, a, a lot more uh, palatable, yeah, it, and it, it's just small tweaks. The way we ask, the way we approach, yeah, the, just just uh, just asking it in ways that sound uh, very non-threatening, mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Patrick, uh, I I I really uh, love what you share. Mm. I think. Just based on that testimony, that story, there's so many things we can dive into. 
you know but I, 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 I want to before we talk into very specific like you know uh, maybe sphere of influence like you know maybe government education etc kind of you know I think I want to talk about one topic that we can really share and that is basically I would say like creative evangelism you know how how do we um, repackage or we re, or, or represent the gospel you know in such a way that is not only uh, creative but most important appealing you know so so like we, we do need to know times have changed you know uh, things that work in the past is not going to work right now because the thing is when, when that is let's say in the past when people want to know about Jesus there are probably only two ways walk into a church or pick up a, a Bible and go read you know but, but right now when people want to know about Christianity you know people can actually go Google there are so many church online services you know, there are uh, Wikipedia, you know, like information is at their fingertips, you know, so people can actually find out more about Christianity just by reading online. And sometimes it might not be necessary, like the accurate information, you know, or the full picture of the gospel, mm. you know, so they probably know about the gospel, but they don't experience the gospel. And I think like a revival lifestyle is really about um, releasing heaven on earth. So it's more than just preaching the gospel, but letting people experience the gospel, letting people ex- encounter God, you know, uh, like an encounter God could be many things. It doesn't have to be supernatural. I think one of the greatest encounter we can give to people is actually love, you know, and, and love can manifest in so many different ways, you know. Uh, I, I love one thing that Pastor uh, Bill Johnson kind of like uh, taught when I was in ministry school is that like, he said this, we owe the world an encounter with Jesus. You know, and, I, and, and I, that's one of my favorite uh, quote and thought. It's like, man, if Jesus truly lives inside of me, means people can really experience him. You know, and I love to uh, like ask this uh, funny question, you know, like I'll ask people like, hey, Patrick, let me ask you, you know, uh, what do you get when you squeeze an apple? Apple juice. Okay, very good, very good. It's not a trick question. It's not a trick question. Very good, very good. One point. Okay, what do you get uh, when you squeeze an orange? Orange juice. Wow, very good, very good, Patrick. Very good. Okay, what do you get when you squeeze a Christian? Christian juice. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Uh, that's pro pro pro. Probably not the correct answer, but my, 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 my point is uh, this, when life squeezes you, when people squeeze you, circumstances squeeze you, what comes out? Is it Jesus that comes out because Christ lives inside of us? Or is it our bad attitude, lousy mood that comes out? You know? So, so, so the, see, the Bible says this, we are, I think Paul says we are the uh, living epistle. Of God which means let's put it this way some people might not pick up a Bible to read about God but you are actually the walking Bible for people to experience and encounter God so the way you live the way you express yourself the way you treat people it is a representation of who live inside of you so so that's why I say like when, when, when people upset you when people squeeze you what comes out is it Jesus you know because if Christ truly really lives in us, whatever happened to us, you know, Christ should, should come out. All right. I'm going to pass this time to, to Jeff to talk more about this uh, topic because I, I, I mean, like, I, I see Jeff as someone, as a pioneer, you know, in creative uh, evangelism. And at the same time, I learned so much about creative evangelism uh, about him. I still remember, I'm going to share one quick, quick story. I remember, I, I don't know if Jesse will remember this, but I think that I was still a very young Christian. It could be probably my first time or uh, uh, second time at the outreach, you know. And Jeff was sharing with me about critique evangelism. And, and he talked about like uh, the analogy of fishing, you know. It's like, it's like how do you entice a fish with the bait? You know, the, the key is not about getting um, people safe on the spot necessarily all the time. Because I, I, I would say, I think one unhealthy way that kind of crept into church is we, we put so much emphasis during an outreach of how many people got saved. You know, instead of how many people we love, we put emphasis on how many people got saved. And 
outreach instead of becoming an event that we go to the streets to love people, it become an event whereby we, we perform to show how many that and show off our badge. Patrick, how many do you get saved today? Tell me. Say, say a number. How many people you got saved? Zero. No? Zero. Oh my gosh. Patrick, you know how many people got saved? I got five people saved. What were you doing? <laughs> you, you are below your quota. <laughs> yeah, you're below your quota. Yeah. So, so since you're below your quota, you need to repent. You need to repent. What else must we make him do? I know. <laughs> He's never gonna dance. <laughs> never gonna dance again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but you, you guys catch catch a drift, you know? Like evangelism is not really about getting how many people safe, it's really about loving the person that's right in front of you. And I, I know Jeff was talking to me about like like you know, some sometimes it's not about getting people hooked onto the bait immediately because a lot of time when we, we, we evangelize we we want to close the deal. You know? And and sometimes people want to want to know more about what you have more than one thing to close the deal, you know, uh, at, a, at a point of time, you know? But you know what, I don't want to butcher what Jeff shared, but I like him share. You know, people are like, what, what, is, what is Clement sharing, you know? I'll, I'll let the originator who, who shared about that. Like, so yeah, Jeff, take it over. Uh, yeah, um, uh, unfortunately, um, e- even in COVID situation, uh, see, the, the way we, we think, how to share the good news, how to share the goodness of God. Uh, notice that I, I, I say good news uh, because sometimes when we share good news, it's not really good news, it's kind of bad news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, repent, oh you sinners, it's really not good news. It's, uh, yeah, so um, you, 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 the, now, we, we are so used to events that now we can't have events. Like we are stuck. We are stuck in this few months. We're technically, well, good f- our um, two major evangelistic events is Good Friday and Christmas, which is uh, it's probably not going to work that well this year. I mean, and, and if your mindset is still going to be like flyers, blast out invitations and all that stuff, right? Uh, well, you're, you're going to deal with issues like uh, too many people gathering and all this stuff. And I believe God, uh, even in this time and this season, is actually kind of challenging us. So what are you going to do about it? You're, you're still going to think that evangelism is going to be like two events. Two times a year you reach out to the lost and then the other 363 days you do nothing that's that's really uh that's really not a good record yeah and and i'm so i mean we we're, we're so used to it we're so used to getting one person doing the job we're so used to getting one anointed preacher we find the best speaker from the west we kind of uh get him on the stage and then we invite all our friends and then we, and it really depends on how he casts the nets. I mean, Jesus says to Peter, I'll make you, follow me, I'll make you fish of men. So, I mean, two ways to fish. One way is a cast net, the other way is a fishing rod. And I mean, that's great if you can bait the fish. Like, I mean, you throw all the f- small fishes, you bait the fish with bread or whatever, they gather. And then it really depends on how skillful that person is to cast the net. So, uh, in, in a way, um, you can have allowed that this was taught to me by my mentor. You, you have, have, you, your message might be lousy, but if your order call is good, you, you still can redeem it. And some people have good message, but a very lousy order call. And uh, it's like, oh, if you want to believe in Jesus, it's alright. If you don't believe, it's okay. It's alright. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's not a good way to cast a net. So... Uh, all the time we depend on one person his his skillfulness his way of skillfully casting a net so they can catch the masses of fishes that's really very event driven like once a year twice a year uh and, and un- unfortunately it ain't gonna happen the same way this year and we need to rethink uh the whole all the whole the church worldwide is going through a transition that yeah, we cannot do things the same way anymore 
And uh, I mean, I keep mm-hmm. telling people for like, I mean, uh, for <laughs> like, I started street evangelism and people don't even realize that they are evangelized. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, I evangelize in a way that people don't even realize that they are evangelized, but they got saved at the end, they got touched by the Lord. And I started this journey in 1998, like getting people, like encountering Jesus. Uh, and, and since 1998, I've been telling Christians, people, leaders, like eventually one day we need to change the way we do things. Because if you if you spend six thousand US dollars to get flyers, public publicity, advertisement advertisements on Facebook or whatever, then only one person out of five thousand people, one person comes to your church and uh, and it is a pre believer. Uh, well, now if that person gets saved, you know what? Bless God, the whole heaven stands still and rejoice. When the person gets sick, but but you know, but uh, if you spend that much resources, you hand out thirty thousand flyers, uh, you you spam advertise advertisements, and and the result is one. Now I'm not the, the whole heaven will rejoice uh, for one soul, but all I'm saying is this: that maybe the times have changed. That what we're doing is not effective, and we if we keep doing the same thing again, expecting different results, that's called insanity eventually it will drive us insane you know and, and uh, I mean for 20 over years I've been telling guys I mean there are some countries that still work for crusades I love crusades I preach in crusades before but I also know as a missionary that when I go into a city the first thing is to understand your crowd and your fishes and if you don't understand what your fish eats and you keep thinking oh that's what they need the same fish in Singapore is going to be the same food that I feed them in Singapore is going to be the same food. Guess what? Every country has their culture. What works here might not work in China. What works here might not work in Pakistan. What works here might not work in... What works in US might not work here. Yeah? So, I, I just want to let you know that... Uh, and and you, us bringing the west to the east or bringing the north to the south or us bringing our culture and the way we do things and without understanding uh, the condition of the fish what they eat it's a dishonor to their culture and I found this out that in the Japanese culture you, you know why the, the Catholics would do a better job in the Japanese culture it's because they everything to them has a ceremony there's a tea ceremony for everything. It's a big deal. And when we Protestants go in and bam, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Well, we destroy all their rituals because we think that that's demonic. Now, you have to understand, if their mindset is yes, they honor ritual. Ritual is just a picture of a bigger reality. It's types and shadows. The communion is a ritual. Water baptism is a ritual. Laying on of hands, it's... It's a type of a greater reality. Anointing, it's a, it's, there, there's a types and shadows there. And I found out by, from a, I was having a, one of the most awesome kind of talk with a, a Japanese uh, missionary. He says, this is how the underground church does communion. When they were in persecution, they, would talk, take a, they don't have wine and they don't have bread. So they will take a piece of candy and they will take a cup of tea and then they will eat the candy as uh, the, the, the flesh of Jesus, yeah, his body. And then they will take the cup and they will turn it three rounds, one round, two rounds, three rounds, and they drink it because it's a trinity. It's just, and, and that's how they take communion. And there's beauty in it. And, and, and you know what? We going into a country imposing our idea and culture of the way we do things whether it's in the east or west it doesn't matter where you are without honoring what they have in their culture it's a dishonor to them because jesus says in heaven 
uh, uh, oh, sorry, John recorded, it says every tribe, nation, and tongue is going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. They are going to sit at the same table. And a matter of fact, if you can act, recognize every tribe, nation, and tongue, right? It means they are distinct feature, they are distinct culture, they are distinct language can still be recognized in heaven. We are not converting them to the West, neither are we converting them to the East. We are converting, we, we are kind of bringing them into this place where when they receive Jesus, they are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of things doesn't work. We, we kind of import things, we kind of, and without understanding that, you know, sometimes the reason why it doesn't work is because uh, God, in, 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 even in heaven, culture is honor. You know, and and and, and it's 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 essential. I'm not gonna be like a. Now there's no way I can be taught why. I mean, I'm not gonna kind of stand in the middle of the street street and uh, uh kind of in the middle of Orchard Road and bam and that that. But this is what I, what I'll mm. do. I will go to hairdresser, which happened before, and I will be constantly asking the Lord for things to say to people. Especially, I love I love eating at restaurants almost at the time when their lunch time is almost finished because there is a time we have left people and there's a time that i talk to waitresses more because it's like about 1 30 and so they have nothing to do and then guess what i mean me and patrick we we, we i think you you and me we did crystal jade before quite a few times uh and and that day i was counting right there was at least about a hundred plus over wait, waitresses and waiters that got healed yeah and through our like uh, yeah i just love <laughs> you can call it ministry whatever but this is what i do i i, I go to hairdresser i mean that is like he she can kind of like uh throw me off the like if i if, if i share anything to her right she still have to cut my hair it's like captive audience like so uh there was this time where i went to my hairdresser at a cartong and and so i was sit, uh, sitting down and then I have a lot of knowledge and, and I look at her and it's really sensitive for knowledge. So I kind of type it on my uh, uh, Samsung phone and I show her and the message was, you have been losing money in your cash register. And, uh, and she, she nod her head and I said, so and I type back and say, I know who did it. And she looked at me and I said, who? So I kind of type out like uh, the guy that is behind me that is wearing glasses and yeah that uh, happened to be one of the employees and so and now you have to understand I've been doing this for 20 over years so I know <laughs> when it's God speaking so I say so I'll, I'll just let you know and uh, I'll come back the next month so uh, I went back the next month and I got I uh, got my hair cut and uh, she was like oh, I don't know how you know it <laughs> but, but he got caught like two weeks later he got caught i mean and like uh well we, we i fired her, him and so uh so he's gone and so then we have the the, the boss and this hairdresser like uh, some of the hairdressers that came hey so how do you do it so i started to teach them while they are cutting my hair like i don't get any slim yeah just in case they miscut my hair or something but i i i will, I will teach them about the prophetic okay this is how you hear god i can teach you how to hear god so guess what i've been doing prophetic lessons in hairdressers hairdressing salons uh that they got interested in hearing the voice of god i mean is that conventional is that unconventional it's a lifestyle what so you're gonna wait three months to christmas before you have the drive just to reach a person that is not gonna work it's not an event it's a lifestyle that you constantly ask jesus it says how can i show the goodness of god to this person and the sooner you realize it's a lifestyle and it then it becomes a life skill yeah so if you don't think that it's a lifestyle it will never become a life skill word of knowledge prophecy is not just ministry skills it's life skills so that's why we never transit word of knowledge healing prophecy out of the church because we keep using the word ministry skill ministry skill ministry skill guess where you're going to apply ministry and as soon as you realize what about life is it possible that like i only spent 15 minutes praying for the sick on saturday or on sunday that's it that's how i'm going to exercise it 
because that's how you because it's a ministry skill so you're limited to ministry but it's life the holy spirit is life the holy spirit is the breath of life you have to, you have to understand that he's empowering you for life not for ministry and, and we all need to understand that because wherever life is ministry is and if you if you don't are not willing to make that transition or change the way you think about life and ministry nothing is going to happen and when you realize life is ministry and ministry is life it's just me just having a good time hearing the voice of god for every single person for every facet of life i overflow into the place and get people to get touched by the lord it doesn't matter who they are where they are that's where really evangelism begins the fishing rod begins it means one reaching one one reaching one instead of waiting for some expert guy who is very good at casting a net what you're going to do with the 363 days of your life it says good friday and christmas is it nothing yeah so uh and and it, it's it's really like how much heaven you want here is, is really a price that you have to pay i'm not talking about going to heaven this and done to you how much heaven you want here and that's what revival is, is how much heaven do we want on earth that's a question we all need to ask ourselves that it doesn't matter whether we are in lockdown or no lockdown life still goes on so if it's if it's in lockdown can we alter our life can we navigate our life in a way that the lifestyle revivalist lifestyle this gift still goes on irregardless of whether there is a ministry time there's a church service or whatever it is yeah so uh yeah. I, I i take too long uh, no it's okay, good it's yeah. good I, so, uh, um, I would just kind of add on from yeah. there um i mean jeff i, I love kind of what you share i just want to um kind of turn to the direction of like uh two key things i feel like so important uh that was mentioned is culture that's number one you know um how we present the gospel is it actually relevant to their culture you know i think that's that's really one 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 thing we, we need to take note of uh and uh another thing is like are we speaking christian language or are we speaking their language you know i think a lot of time uh, uh the way we we share the gospel is speaking christian language not speaking their language not understanding their culture you know i think mo most most people will know like the most common way to present gospel is that like, if you don't believe you will go to hell <laughs> it's always that heaven and hell analogy you know the contrast you know we we, should, we, we, should, we kind of talk about this in i think in our first session we talk a lot about heaven, like what the gospel is so i won't go into that but i i i, I love like even that story that jeff talked about you know like even a hairdresser and i want to share you see I, I, I've been, um, be, before I, I was, uh, before I was at BSSM, I, I was with Jeff, you know, following him around, you know, so I seen him, he loved to pray for waitresses, you know, and when, when I'm alone, you see, this, this is always the thing here, what you see, what you observe, or even what you hear, people testimony, but when you are alone, and when the opportunity arises, do you take action? All right, I'm, I'm going to really hit hard on this, because like, that there's really um, no point in just hearing and not acting on it, all right? And, and that, that was my journey. Like, I, I, I've seen how Jeff will pray for waitresses. I've seen how Jeff will, you know, um, move in supernatural, actually outside the church, you know, in, you know outside the, the doors of the church. And I still remember there was one time uh, I was in, invited to go to, okay, can I say this country? <laughs> um, it's, a, uh, it's a neighboring country. You know where where yeah um where yeah okay that's that's gonna say you know and and I it is sensitive to preach the gospel you know and basically I was there to speak at a youth camp you know so um um uh, my friend uh, uncle actually owned the whole retreat center you know so I mean youth camp have their own schedule right so my it wasn't time for me to preach so he said like, oh you can just rest you can do whatever. And part of me is like, I'm a bit tired and sick of waiting, you know, so I went to look for the sick, <laughs> you know. So, so me and my friend, you know, who is my translator, we went to the uh, reception. So you need to know this is like a retreat center. There's a receptionist, there are cleaners, you know. Think, think of like a, a resort or like a hotel, you know, something like that. You know, so so I, I, I started talking to the um, uh, receptionist, you know, because, because I've seen how Jeff does it right now at the opportunity. Either I can do it, learn from it, or I can walk away and go to my room to sleep. 
And I'm like, man, I'm not, gonna, I, I, I'm not here to come and sleep, you know, even though it's a retreat center, you know, I can sleep later in the night. I, I really wanted to see heaven coming to earth and, and it's a life sound. So I started asking the recept, you know, with, with the help of translator because I don't speak their language, you know, and, and the first they said, hey, do you have a back pain? And, and she was like, yeah. How did you know that? I said, oh yeah, I can, I can sense it. I can sense it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm like a physician assistant. I'm like a therapist. You know, are you okay if I just kind of put my hand, you know, and, and give a free session? And she was like, oh yeah, sure. You know, and, and she was instantaneously healed. You know, and she was like, wow, how do you do that? I'm like, do you have friends that want to try this? Because I'm, I'm, and I just say, I'm, I, I'm, I'm free right now and I love to give free session. I love to see people get, get pain free. And she brought me into the office that was behind her. So, so it started with one person. And right now, you know, the office will have maybe like four or five more people. And more healings happen, you know, in the office. I went to the office, usually nobody entered there because it's a staff office. But I went in and, and they introduced me like, oh yeah, you know, he's like a special physician assistant. You know, anyone has pain, kind of line up right now, you know. And, and, and then after that, I, 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 I just say, you know, who, do you have this shoulder pain? Do you have this pain? You know, and, and they would say, how did you know that? I said, yeah, I just know. You know, so one by one, they got healed. You know, and I was like, wow, this is exciting. Something's breaking out. And I just say like, hey, do you have like more stuff? And they say, we do. And this is crazy. So the receptionist take the walkie talkie and start to radio, radio everyone on the premises. Hello everyone, if you, have, if you are sick, please come to the lobby right now. There is a free healing session right now. If you are sick, you know, and I was just waiting in the lobby one by one, you know, people was coming, you know. And, and you see, how this happened is because I started to do something with the one person that was in front of me. I honored her, you know, I released healing, it opened up. But how I even begin with the one person? Because I was inspired by Jeff's story. I was inspired by, oh man, he was praying for waitress and more waitress comes out. You know, you see, when I hear people's testimony, the testimony is, is the spirit of prophecy. It means that God do it again. But you, we also need to understand when God do it again, it might be slightly different. You know, and in, in, in my story, in my testimony, it's not waitresses, it's actually the staff of a retreat center. And, and it all happened, not only we step out in obedience, but we're willing to step out. You know, and, and my, my point at this, uh, for now is this, as we continue to share story, don't let it be like, wow, I've got a hairdresser, Wow, got people in retreat center got, got, got touched, got healed. You know, don't just let it be a story, but let it be something that, you know, encourages you, spur you on to like, you know what? I'm going to do something similar tomorrow. I'm going to try something later on. All right. I'm going to pass to Patrick to kind of, kind of like continue. If there's, you know, like maybe you have other stories you want to share or you have something to add on in terms of like, you know, learning people language, how we can present the gospel or release heaven on earth outside of our church in such a simple and effective way. Yeah, so uh, one time, there was, this was in 2014. Yeah, I was in a cafe with uh, two brothers. Uh, this was in Jakarta. All right. And, and, and these two Christian brothers, they, they have seen... They, they have attended uh, my seminar and uh, Jeff's seminar, you know, so we, they, they've seen us teach about healing and uh, the prophetic. And we were sitting down and um, yeah, they were asking me questions about, you know, how to move in the prophetic. And, and, and so, um, yeah, I, I thought, okay, that's the best way to do it is just demonstrate. So, um, you know, as the waiter was just coming over to serve us, I, I asked God for a word. And I somehow, if I don't remember wrongly, you know, I, I uh, the, the word was throat, you know, so I, I, asked, I, I asked the waiter, you have something with, with your throat and he said yes so I prayed for him and he felt instantly better and so the two uh, Christian brothers were very uh, excited and I said to them you know you, you guys can actually do the same thing alright 
And so in the in the cafe, there was another group sitting at uh, another corner near the entrance. And it was a group of ladies. It was a group of uh, Indonesian uh, ladies, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, Indonesian Thai Thais, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so I, I say, yeah, there's a group of uh, Indonesian Ibus there. Uh, yeah, why why don't you just ask? Yeah, uh, ask God, you know, to give you a word. And and so so they they did, you know, one brother got I think an eye or another brother got something else, and and so. So, so you know, I made sure that everyone got a word and then, okay, I said, let's approach them. And so we went over and uh, they introduced me, you know, because they speak Indonesian, right? Oh, hi, yeah, this is, this, this is uh, from Singapore, you know, this, yeah. And we are, we are, we are just tr uh, trying this exercise, yeah. And uh, yeah, just wondering if any of you, you have an eye problem, you have this problem, you have that. And yeah, basically, basically they look quite shocked. They look like quite apprehensive. What is this? But they soften up, you know, like, uh, and, and, and basically uh, what, whatever we say, there, there, there were, there were the, a lady with an eye issue, there was a lady with some other issues, the, the issues that were pointed out. Not, not all of them were open. Uh, we would say, oh, can we bless you? So once, they, you know, they were, they were quite surprised that we got, you know, whatever issues we, we mentioned, uh, you know, there was someone in the group who, who have it. Uh, can, can, you know, can, can we bless you? Uh, not all of them uh, not all of them was comfortable with with uh, receiving blessing, but there was there was one or two, and so so we prayed over them. We released a word of blessing, and then we thank them for the time. Yeah, we uh, yeah we we are just uh, learning to hear from God, learning to hear from Jesus. Thank you for your time. God bless you. So uh, so that was how we how how uh how we did that yeah just approaching a a a, a group uh of, of strangers in a cafe and and just being as non-threatening as possible because it's three guys and this is a group of ladies yeah yeah and this is indonesia yeah uh but it can be done come on yeah and and it's and for these two brothers, it's their first time. Now, after that experience, one of, one of them, uh, actually both of them, they, 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 they were evangelists in their own right. And uh, one of them were like just approaching every person, you know, he, he meets on the streets, like praying for them. Yeah, the other one was also, um, yeah, just, just praying for people in, in different uh, different places, including praying for police officers. So, um, yeah. So, so it is. Yeah, it's something that that is caught. Yeah, and it's something very doable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank, thank, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, Patrick. I, I, I think I want to encourage you. I think what Patrick shared was was something really good. Like. I'll put it straight, like, uh, we, we, we don't chase after signs and wonder. Signs and wonders follow us. But, you know, I, I heard Bill say this, we, do, uh, like we, we, we don't follow signs and wonder, signs and wonder follow us. But, in, sometimes we can be in a season where we are so new to this, we actually got to follow people who move in signs and wonder until signs and wonder follow you. You know? And I think what Patrick shared was something in that line, like, he brought two people who, who are kind of new to this evangelism thing, you know, you know, talking to strangers, all this thing. And after that, they caught it. And then they move it on their own. And that is actually a similar story. I, I followed Jeff and I caught something from him, you know, and I make it my own flavor, you know. 
And so my encouragement is to use this. If doing it alone is scary, guess what? Do it in a group of friends. Find people who might be, have more experience in going to the streets or talking to strangers. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll put it straight. When your goal is to love the person in front of you and to share the love of Christ, there's no failure. There's actually no failure. I think one, one of the things that stop us from really manifesting the supernatural outside of the church is actually, what if nothing happened? The thought, it's a very real thought. What if I pray for someone on the street and nothing happened? What if I preach a gospel to someone on the streets and he didn't get saved? What if I give a word of knowledge and it's wrong? What if, what if? But let me tell you another what if. What if you pray for a person on the street and they got healed? What if you share the gospel to a stranger and they got saved? What if your word of knowledge was accurate? Instead of letting fear drive our agenda, we should let love drive our agenda. Now, that's a good word. I felt that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? We got to let love be the center, center, center stage and let love drive our agenda. Like, man, I'm just really here to love these people in front of me. You know? And, and I, I can't emphasize more on being creative. All right? I would say all of us have a measure of creativity. And creativity is also tied to culture, you know? And, and I think one of the most creative way, one way to do evangelism is actually treasure hunt. You know, I'm not sure if you're new to treasure hunt, but um, treasure hunt is basically like, you know, let's say three of us, Patrick, Jeff, and me, we just sit down and we're going to pray. You know, we're going to ask God for clues. So Jeff might get green shirt. I will get maybe a black flip flop, you know, and maybe Patrick get a ponytail. <laughs> All right. So then now we are looking for, a, a, a person with a ponytail with green shirt and a black flip flop, you know, and 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 I mean this is like prophetic evangelism. We're asking God for clues to narrow down to a very special person, and you see when I found a person, this is what I usually tell the person, and say so like, hey, excuse me, sir, you know, we are playing a game called treasure hunt, and you are the treasure we're looking for. Look at look at the clues. You got a green shirt, you got a ponytail, and you got a black flip flop. Can we ask you some question? Because in, in order to complete this game, you know, we, we, this is a very exciting game. In, the, in order to complete this game, we need to find a treasure and your treasure. And, and people will be like, wow, I got to help someone complete an a, a objective. It's like they felt like, wow, this is a game, you know? And, and you see, all along, we never present it whereby like, hey, we're actually Christian, we're trying to share the love of Jesus. I mean, I mean like that is the end goal. But to people, they are more receptive. Oh, wow, you're playing a game. Okay, I should be a nice guy and help you complete the game. You know? So I, I can't emphasize more on being creative. Mm. You know, because I think like what Jeff said, you know, the church is going through a transition, you know. We, we have to rethink how we reach out to people. You know, I, I really love what Jeff talked about, you know, like the, the, the two big days are, you know, Good Friday and Christmas. And now, I mean, like social distance, you can't have your Christmas show, you know. Where we invite people to watch a Christmas play and then have auto call. Uh, I mean, just being honest, like you know, there are many restrictions that we are un, un, uh, we uh, we don't know what it's going to look like in the next few months, you know. But I think that's where our heart. You are a revival. You carry the power of the Holy Spirit, and no matter where you go, heaven can manifest. Mm. You know. So I'm going to pass Jeff to kind of continue on this uh, train of thought, you know, and maybe share uh, in other areas because. The, the thing is, I think what we've been sharing so far, the stories are actually like, you know, um, kingdom come in the streets, you know, but we, but we all know, you know, I mean, some, some of us know that there's, a, there's a seven mountains, the, the different sphere of influence, you know. How does uh, a revivalist lifestyle look like when you're called to an education? What does a revi revivalist lifestyle look like when you're called to the marketplace, to the government, etc.? You know, so maybe uh, let's just take a turn on, on the topic and we'll I'll let Jeff kind of start off. Uh, yeah, uh, well, um, Esther, you say, uh, uh, this is not white lines at all. My father is a physician from the Middle East. Which is how you see it. Yeah? Jesus called God many things. Like a hand. Jesus, God is like a hand that protected Israel. There are types and shadow yeah even Paul used uh, quite a number of these things in Acts chapter 17 but we're trying not to answer all those things but uh, these are not lies at all these are types and shadow the same way Jesus is healer Jesus is a provider we're just presenting him in different ways 
uh, I would recommend you to try Treasure Hunt if you have not. Uh, and anyway, uh, uh, one of the things is um. Let, let me think. Yeah. So so here's the thing. The you see the the point is like um. You see, if you anchor yourself on what if the person doesn't receive or if the person doesn't get healed, right? Uh, now, here's the thing. If, if, if you look at Genesis, um, the word that God create man, the word is Yatsa. Yeah? Uh, and if you look at God saying in Genesis that the, the, now this is before the flood and God says um, he was heartbroken because man's thoughts and intention was towards evil the word intention there is the same word yes sir if you look in the Hebrew your, your strong will translate it into a different English word but if you look in the Hebrew it's the same word one is a noun one is a verb so actually when God create man is the same word and when man's intentions and thoughts are towards evil is the same word that means what thoughts create world thoughts create reality so if your thought is that what if the person going to get healed right you are actually creating a reality thoughts are powerful yeah what we think is powerful as much as you think oh it's just a fleeting thought right it's not a fleeting thought at all you you think that a person who say, oh, my marriage failed. And tell me, come and tell me my marriage failed yesterday. No, your marriage didn't fail yesterday. It was a process of thoughts that, uh, and decisions that were made. And then you, uh, you guys are make those thoughts concrete. And so therefore, it was a process to fail. But so eventually, thoughts will create reality. And that's very important. That's very important. And so if your thoughts are saying, what if a person is going to get healed, what if a person uh, doesn't receive Jesus, well, well guess what, you're chicken out. <laughs> yeah, that's so, your thoughts make you into a chicken, that's it. Uh, but um, I, I, I don't. So if, like, uh, so if your thoughts are saying, if the person is going to get healed, right, your, 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 that means your thoughts are anchored in a... Uh, uh, not possibilities but negativity and uh you, so and, and 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 you need to know that G, when jesus says all things are possible for those who believe right he's asking you to kind of push your thoughts to this place where you think possibilities rather than negativity uh how many of you who think like and you want to pray for the person and you think wow the person look, what if the person don't get healed well how many of you actually did it after that talk? <laughs> you probably didn't do it. That's what I'm trying to say. That means your thoughts your create reality. The same way God created man. Uh, and the word, yes sir, if you look in the Tyre's definition of Old Testament, oh uh, sorry, uh, not Tyre's, um, what is that? Uh, hold on, let me, let me look at it. Uh, there's a cost reference that, oh, Brown's, Brown's driver and bricks. Uh, that's a good dictionary to look at. Uh, it's actually the one of the the meaning is fashion. That means what uh, and when God made man, he's fashioning. Fashioning means I have to look at myself. And I have to I have an idea and a blueprint. Therefore, I make something. So that means what it is is when you think of negativity, you are already starting to fashion something out, and that that's that's not going to be very helpful. Yeah. Uh, so and he wants you to be anchored on pos like possibilities, not negativity. And uh, I, and, and this is a huge deal, though, because for a lot of us, sometimes when we be born, God, actually a lot of times we get born again, we don't know how to relate to non Christians. As a matter of fact, right, when you are non Christian, you know how to relate to your friends, but you are born again, you don't know how to relate to your friends. Now, now here's the thing. The, uh, the holiness of Jesus doesn't repel sinners. As a matter of fact, the holiness of Jesus actually attracts sinners. Have you ever realized that? That, that the sinners are super comfortable with Jesus. 
it, not comfortable with their sin, but in a way they're comfortable with the presence that suddenly at the end, they started repenting. They are so comfortable with Jesus. You know? And in that presence, that people actually change their mind about who they are and they come into the knowledge of who He is. So, that means one of the natures of holiness that is you attract sinners, not repel them. <laughs> so, something for all of us to think about. And, you know, this, and, and I, I, every time when all these things come, I started to look at it and say, okay, I'm not going to look at it negatively. Like, there was this time when, uh, I mean, we were, since we're talking about Indonesia, we're talking about Indonesia then, like, uh, <laughs> and we were doing this um, outreach and, uh, I watched some of my friends, the pastor, like he, he did this flyer that makes me look like some Chinese uh, master. master or something. <laughs> I don't know why he did that. It wasn't my idea, but he did that. And uh, I mean, uh, one of my friends, David, David Woody, he, he carried all the flyers. And this is how he do it. He go to the wedding and he's a photo photographer. And there was this... Uh, a policeman that got uh, he felt he led to kind of give the flyers to the policeman and then he started praying for the policeman in the wedding and they got healed 10 of them got healed that's why I, why I remember correctly uh, and so then the, this police chief came and actually uh, asked him I said what, 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 are, what are you doing he said well I, I, I use the name of Jesus and uh, your, your, your policeman your, your people all got healed and uh, so and he was uh, really excited and I uh, said and, and and so this is how he give up flyers now so, uh, so you get healed you just hand out the flyers and at the day like on the day itself like Patrick was there like we have so many people that was coming man I mean it, it was funny in a way that uh, a lot of them are uh, actually a lot of them are not Christians they are like free believers and all that stuff so we have quite some very interesting people that comes and uh, uh, there was this lady that got breast cancer stage 2 and uh, and she, uh, she I, I, I told her okay put your hands on your tumor and just say after me <laughs> say I'm not going to pray you're going to pray and uh, now yeah it's unorthodox guess what uh, it's still, it's still uh, now and so uh, she, so uh, she said, uh, she said, what should I pray? I said, yeah, just follow me. In the name of Jesus, I command this tumor to dissolve in Jesus' name. Amen. And, and so she prayed, and then she <laughs> like, it's getting smaller. Okay, do it one more time. And so she kept doing it until like, it was like, you know, like uh, this saggy skin that, you know, you used to have a lump, then suddenly that <laughs> it's gone. Then it's like, that's amazing. Like, can you teach me? Can you write down the prayer? So, so, uh, and then wrote down this prayer so he said oh in the name of Jesus okay okay try it so she she turned around and uh her, her friend actually has migraine so she put her hands on the friend's head and just repeat the the paper like, in the name of Jesus I command this pain to leave amen and so the friend got you and she was totally amazed like how did this happen and so then we explained to her like wow, wow this is the healing power of Jesus be healed in Jesus' name, and uh, and then uh, and she received Jesus, you know, and uh, it was so um, it was so interesting that uh, David came to me and said uh, there was this guy that called, and he says, uh, "Can your master talk to my dead father?" I don't know what you know about it. My master talked to my dead father. And, I, and uh, he, he looked at me and said, and, and he said, Pastor Jeff, can you do that? And I said, okay, obstacle, uh, possibilities or obstacles, possibility or obstacles, Lord, is there? And I need to see it through your eyes. Is there any way to redeem this? Because generally, typically, all of you will say no because you don't talk to the dead, right? Yeah. And I, I, I told David, like, somehow I got a f interesting, I, I have a give of faith that it's going to work. So they came. So they came, the the wife was a the wife was a Catholic. The husband is a another religion, <laughs> I almost say. And then the, the 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 sister is a Christian. The sister had no idea what's going on. Like this is what is going on. And so they sat down and uh it says, Okay. And so the man says, Oh, I want to hear from my dead father. Can you do that? He said, Wait, wait. Now I go through the Holy Spirit 
who is sent by Jesus and he knows all things. They say, no, 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 I want to talk to my dead father. They say, wait, 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 wait. Well, since you're here, you drove your Mercedes here. And so then I, well, you must just, just try. And so he says, all right. So I said, okay, good. Um, mm. So, all right, let me see. Like, shaka, like praying, praying. And then I, 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 I told him, you know, your father left your business to you. And there are two partners that, that he has, and which is actually his good friends. Actually, now they're turning on you because the business wasn't doing good. And so, therefore, you lost this, the, the, the trust of these two partners. And now you don't know what to do. And your father is a very hard man, though. He doesn't really kind of take care of you a lot. He just gives you money and you, you do whatever you want in life. And, but you know what? Yet you look yearn to see, feel intimacy. And you know what? And even to his deathbed, right? You actually wanted to hear three words and you didn't get to hear those three words. And I'm going to tell you what those three words is, which is, I love you. And he started to cry. Now, for those of you who don't know what I'm doing, I'm doing an inner healing and sozo with him. Yeah? Uh, and, and he started to cry. And... And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and say, wait, I saw another picture. Like, uh, I saw your mom and your mom have panic attacks. And when your mom had panic attacks, I saw the house. She will go outside and she will start scolding and beating the dog. You have a dog and she's got, and they laugh. The, <laughs> the, well, the cat, uh, like uh, the, the wife of the cat, they laugh. And the husband, who is the other religion, laugh. And this, uh, the sister, which was a Christian, like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> then I started bringing Jesus. I said, actually, it's Jesus that told me every single thing about you. And he loves you. The three words that you never get to hear, Jesus is speaking over you because he's the Father in heaven. He says, I love you. And <laughs> it became an encounter. It became such an unusual encounter where they started to felt the love of God. Uh, yeah, it was interesting because then the police came and says, well, we are practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. And then, <laughs> then uh, I, I was in my mind, I was like, I was so angry with that. Like, I mean, definitely someone reported it. Uh, it's probably... Uh, the, well, there's a witch doctor opposite. I don't know whether he did, but anyway, I want to go out and say, you know, like, uh, yeah, you want the old license or the new license? The old license is uh, De Deuteronomy 28. The new license in uh, Mark 16, MK 16. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, lay hands on the sick, the blind, see the deaf, hear the lame. That is our authority. That is our license. What else you want? This is the word of God. And, uh, but David stopped me and said, no, 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 no. That will get us in trouble. And so... Uh, <laughs> And he went with them to the police station to solve this whole thing. They, we, we might have to close the whole thing down. And then when he went to the police station, the same police chief that he saw in the wedding came out and says, Oh, it's you. He says, Yeah, it's me. What the odds, right? That is a divine encounter. And then eventually, like I said, so what's happening? He said, Well, they, are, they say that we're practicing medicine without a license. And then the police chief said, oh, that's, they're fine, they're fine. If you need bodyguards and security guards, like, I'll send these same two police back with you. They'll look after you, don't worry. <laughs> and the same two guys came back, and they weren't really happy. Like, <laughs> but you know, you know what? Uh, at, at the end, I remember, this was one of the most unusual testimonies. There was this guy that came, and he was the owner of the place. He sat down, and uh, I started, he says, he's the owner of the place, I pray for him. I said, you like fishing. Well, he thought I was some kind of like, because a poster looks like some kind of uh, <laughs> Chinese master. Like, I don't know why they do that still. Until today, I still don't understand why. But, uh, and, uh, and I said, well, you, 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 you ha I, I keep seeing fishes. He said, yeah, I have a fishing business in, uh, in Kalimantan. And he says, okay, uh, then uh, do you, ha you have this old guy that's working with you for 10 years and he has glasses, slightly plump, bald headed and you need to fire him. If you don't fire him, he'll take one third of the fisherman with him. And he looked at me and says, wow, you're correct. I just fired him two weeks ago. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, that's good. And, and he looked at me and said, are you a pastor? He said, yeah, yeah I am a pastor. I said, yeah, and uh, I want to ask you something. Uh, now, he, he says, like, uh, he says, well, I, I, I built a church. Now, you have to understand, he's not a Christian. He is uh, from another religion. <laughs> he's in, in uh, he says, 
uh, I built a church and there are 500 people there and then but I fired the pastor I say why uh, well because the pastor actually kind of shared that all of them have to give them 10 percent of their salary and well that's that's like and, and he says I'm a businessman I know that's wrong <laughs> so I fire him I say what about the sheep what about the people he said well they pastor themselves because <laughs> no that's not the way to pastor the church like I mean you I mean I understand and that's not totally correct but I'll tell you what uh, we're going to connect and you know that uh, we're going to introduce you to some of my pastor friends you'll figure out something for that now somehow at the end of the day we bump into this guy who is how many of how many of you heard of a non-Christian church planter? I mean, this is the first time I heard of someone who is not a Christian who planted churches. And somehow we just got this church has like 500 people. And somehow we just connect the dots. Like, no, guess what? If, if the Christians are not going to do it, then God will use other means to do it. Just want to let you know. And somehow, you, we all of us have to look at situations there are things that we don't like. People are going to tell us things and, uh, and, and we need to think possibilities than negativity. What if the person don't get healed? What if the person don't get saved? What if the, I get rejected? It's not going to help you in this journey of being a revivalist. If you want to be a revivalist, right? The first thing is you need the revivalist mindset. And the, the revivalist mindset is never one that says, what if nothing happens? A revivalist mindset is if nothing is happening, when I'm there, something is going to happen. I am the defining factor whether things are going to happen. Whether this place is going to be on fire and the glory of God comes down, I'm the defining factor. Yeah? So, uh, and you know what? Yeah, think possibilities. Stop looking at your family and say, oh, wow, well, God is not going to move. Tomorrow, act as if, God is going to move tomorrow with your husband, with your family, and see what happens, you know? I mean, you've been stuck in a way of thinking negatively for so many years, nothing is happening, or why don't you think the other way and see whether, whether God crashes or not? So, uh, yep. Uh, yeah. I, th thank you, Jeff. I, I, I love um, kind of, uh, what you just shared just now. I, I, I think I want to draw to a point of this is like, I think we've been sharing some testimony and story, and they might be kind of like unconventional for some of people who first hear it, you know? But I, 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 think, I think the point I want to put is this, like, just because you never heard of it before, you just can't throw the whole thing away, you know? Because I think we are talking about creative uh, evangelism, you know, understanding people's culture, you know? Like, I think just now what, what kind of like Jeff shared, you know, uh, the testimony, I think to, to, to some Christian, you may be like, that's kind of weird. You know, that's kind of weird. But I love how we put it. It's about thinking of the possibility and seeing through the eyes of Jesus. But I think one key thing is, how can the Lord redeem this? How can the Lord redeem this? I'm going to share one quick testimony. Uh, and I think the point is, is like, we, we are not just called to redeem time. We are supposed to redeem what was originally supposed to be ours. And one of the things that, that, that was ours is actually the prophetic. You know? So, so... So hearing God's voice is our portion, it's our inheritance. And, uh, okay, let me just jump into the story real, real fast. Uh, I think a couple years ago, I was in Taiwan, I was ministering. And you need to know, Taiwan culture has a very big culture of the night market. The night market is where people eat, shop, you know, it's bustling with people. And I was just walking through one of the famous night market and I saw this, um, like this uh, fortune telling booth. You know, and they say that if you, uh, you, can, uh, you can ask one question for 200 Taiwan dollars. So I look at my friend, I'm like, hey, I can do something similar and I can do it for free, you know? And, and I was like, man, we, 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 we need to do something like that we, because I want people to hear the voice of God, not hear the voice of, you know, this fortune teller, you know? So, so, so my friend got, got a booth set up. So we brought the youth there, we set up the booth and, and, and we just say like free spiritual reading, you know? Or, you know? So, so... And people like, and that this, and I remember the first lady that walked past and she would look at me, very skeptic, you know, like, what is this? I say, oh, do you want to know uh, about your life? I can tell you about your life, you know? And, and, and she's like, really? I say, yeah. I say, someone, I say, this is free, you know? 
and and I mean like in Asia, Asian loves free stuff. You know, when we tell people it's like free, they 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 like okay, you know, there's no string attached, there's no obligation, you know. And and I was saying like, hey, it's free. And then she was kind of kind of like a bit hesitant, you know. So I I, I was kind of a bit a little bit kind of inside, I'm a little bit annoyed. It's like, hey, do you want it or not? So I straight kind of word of knowledge really. I just kind of look at her, say, you are really fa- uh, you are currently thinking about money because you're facing a financial crisis. And she's like, how did you know that? She immediately sat down in front of me, you know? And I started like, kind of like, you know, uh, asking different questions because I started to get what, the moment she said, I started to tap into the prophetic, I started to get what the knowledge, you know? And I started to ask her like, hey, um, do, you, do you have this wooden table uh, in your home? And every morning you'll sit at a wooden table, you'll drink coffee, you'll read newspaper. And she says, yeah, 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 right, you're right. And actually this morning you'll read newspaper, I saw you read newspaper and you're actually looking for a second job, like a part-time job. And she kind of freaked out like, how did you know that? Yeah, that was true. That was true. And, and then I started talking about like, yeah, I saw like uh, two, two, I saw like there are two, two kids. You probably have two kids, maybe like two daughters. And she was like, she was like a bit spooked out. I said, yeah, you're right. I have two daughters. And, and then I, I started going further down the trail. I started saying, like, I saw June and September. Does that make sense to you? Like June and September and say, yeah, June is actually my birthday and September is my daughter's birthday. And she was like, like, wow, glued. You know, she got, she, she was like giving me all her attention, you know, and I just kind of like told her like, let, let, let's talk about your daughter. You have two daughters, you know, one study very well. You're very proud. You're not worried about the daughter. The other one study not so well. You're very worried. You don't know what's going to happen to her for her future. And she said, yeah, you're right, man. How did you know all these things? I said, yeah, don't worry. I'll tell you who tell me, you know, I'm going to continue. And, and finally, I, I kind of I kind of say 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 something like I saw number three. Do you stay in block three or maybe like the third floor, you know? And then she say she say yeah, I stay in the third floor. And then she like now she's now she's thinking like am I some FBI or CIA like track her or I don't know what? And she was like really like a little bit freaked out already, you know? And then I, I started to ask this question. Do you know how I know? I say yeah, I don't know. Can you tell me how how do you know all this information about me? I say well. The, the, the truth is this, there's a spirit that knows all things. He's an eternal spirit and he lives inside of me. And this spirit speaks to me. And this spirit, his name is called the Holy Spirit. And I received the Holy Spirit through the one person called Jesus Christ. And the moment I mentioned Jesus, he said, oh, 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 but I can't, I'm not a Christian. I cannot be a Christian, you know? And then I said, like, oh, don't worry. I'm not asking you to be a Christian today. All I want you to know is that Jesus loves you and he knows all these things about you. He knows what you're going through, you know? And, and most importantly, he knows you stay on the third floor. And she's like, okay, 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 you know? <laughs> she was like, you know, like, okay, you're right, man. You know, like I said, I just want to let you know, there's a God that loves you and there's a God that knows you, you know? And, and that's, that's my main goal for you, to, to know that there's a loving God, you know? Whether you want to receive Jesus or not, it's entirely up to you, but can I bless you? I want to bless you with the blessing of God. And she was very open to it. You know, and I prayed for her and she left with, with a different continence. She, she left with like a weight, like lifted off, uh, off her, you know. And, and, and my point of sharing this story is this. I'm talking about culture. Taiwan has a big culture of the night market. So I'm, I'm becoming a Jew onto the Jews. I am relating them to their culture, you know. And, and, and Taiwan is a Chinese country. Chinese love like spiritual reading, fortune telling, whatever, you know, where people can tell them about the future, the past, present, they are excited, they, they are interested, you know? So I'm, I'm relating to a lingo that connects to your heart and to their culture. But one key thing I want to emphasize on is this, like, oh, come on, like we as Christian who have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, who can hear God, because God is the only person that knows people's past, present and future. All these fortune tellers out there, all, all, all they rely on is what, what we call a spirit of divination. All right? And, and, and they only know your past, they know your present, but they don't know your future because only God knows the future. You know, but they will deduce the future based on what they gather on the past and the present. And, and the thing is, if people, I believe, I believe this way, people are hungry for the supernatural. People are hungry to know what their future looks like. And if we Christian who can hear the voice of God are not rising for such a time like this, that we can tell people like, this is God's plans for you. This is how God sees you. If they don't have all this, guess what? They're actually going to all this fortune teller. And that is why I have such a big heart 
to raise people up to hear the voice of God. Because when we hear the voice of God, you know, we, we don't need people to go to fortune tell. We, we are that, that direction for, for people. Because God lives inside of us and we can tell people like, hey, I can tell you how, what God is thinking. I can tell you what's God's plan. I can tell you what God has for you. You know? And, and, and I, I know some, some of the story that Jeff, Patrick or me share might be unconventional. But, but, the, but the point is this, we need to learn how to relate to culture and speak people's language. We need to redeem it. You know? Come on. <laughs> I hope people are getting this, you know? I'm going to pass to Patrick to kind of add on, you know, uh, whatever the Lord has placed on his hearts. All right. Well, uh, I spotted one comment uh, by Patricia Go, and that's just a very good comment you have. Uh, the comment is, uh, many Christians criticize others for bringing healings and the supernatural onto the streets without conversions. And yes, Patricia, you are right. I have encountered this before many times. Uh, so he, here's, here's an interesting uh, uh, experience I had. This was a few years back, a few years ago. Uh, I was doing street healing one day. Uh, it was at Clarkey with another group. And uh, I, I met I, uh, an ex-colleague. You know, uh, and this ex colleague went to the street healing for the first time. She she said, and and I was very excited to see her. All right, and I, it, I, you know, she appeared very hungry. You know, she when I talked to her, she's Chinese speaking. You know, she she's like, oh, uh, seemed to be very eager to to evangelize to people. So, uh, so I. You know, I invited her to come to our Sunday healing outreaches. So she came and observed. And, and then she started criticizing. You know, she started like texting me. And uh, when she texts me, it's like, it's like every day, you know, from morning, she'll text, 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 12 hours nonstop. Like she was doing it for like one whole, one whole week. Actually, until today, I still receive texts from her. All right. <laughs> but you know she was, she was texting me like 12 hours you know like the full day you know non-stop every day actually more than one week uh, it's a few weeks you know like so uh and and basically she would be like saying oh the way you all do evangelism is not correct yeah yeah you're not uh doing it right uh this is not God's way. You'll never preach God's word. No, well, it's not God's way, it's Yahweh. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. So uh then that in the process, you know, I was in the beginning I was trying my best to dialogue with her, but it's really tiring it's because uh, you can you imagine, you know, that every day like twelve hours you receive text, you know, from from her. Wow. Bro, wow. that's long suffering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. So and and like she she also gave the impression that wow she she was a very she was very good at evangelizing or or rather she was very no not that she was very good at evangelizing she was very zealous for evangelism right so i i i told her straight you know yeah uh yeah i i didn't bring much people to to the lord yeah i that's why i i can't remember what exactly i said i i i basically say yeah i'm not I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, I did, on a personal basis, I didn't bring much people to the Lord. I, I'm not the strong, strong evangelist. Yeah. Uh, and she was basically telling me what to do. Right. And, and, uh, so finally, I, uh, uh, finally I asked her, um, so how many people you brought to the Lord? You know what was the answer? How, how, or rather, how many people you converted? Because she will text a lot of people, like arguing with them, like getting that, you know, uh, getting to them to try to see her point. And uh, the answer was oh, one. She brought her, her sister came to Christ. That's it. 
everyone else who she tried to evangelize try to avoid her. <laughs> All right. And I mean the sister cannot avoid her. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Family. Uh, yeah. I I and I told her. Oh. Uh, yeah. I, I brought. I I was very shocked. You know. I I said I I said I I brought a few dozen people to Christ. You know, like over the years, on a personal basis. You know, if you talk about, uh, you know, from 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 the stage, you'll be a few thousand people to Christ. But on a personal basis, you know, a few dozen people to Christ, maybe fifty over people to Christ. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, and I feel it's very little, and you, because you know, uh, because Jeff, on a personal basis, he he brought a few thousand people to Christ one on one on one, all right. <laughs> so, I I brought a few thousand people to Christ over years. That's very little to me, and and and, and you are telling me what to do because you brought one person to Christ, and you're telling me that. <laughs> Uh, what I'm doing is wrong because I never preach the gospel the right way. I I was very very shocked. <laughs> All right, I was really very very shocked. Uh, but basically, there are <laughs> a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of Christians, criticizing uh people who are evangelizing but they themselves are not evangelizing that's right come on it's either they, they are not evangelizing or they are evangelizing in a way that is not getting people saved like yes she is putting effort like she is like spamming her friends about evangel about about christ but you know it's like pushing people away right and and so bless her heart she she has zeal but that zeal is not producing fruit. And, and, uh, and, yeah, I, I, the thing is, it is so important for, for us that when we reach out to people, that we are reaching out to people at that level. You know, when I, when, when I reach out to a person who's non Christian, I don't use Christian lingo. I, yeah, I don't say on. can I prophesy over you? I have a word I have a word for you. I have a prophecy for you. I have a word of knowledge. <laughs> no. The person will not understand. Oh. Alright? I I have to I have to use words, phrases, questions that are non religious, that are non threatening, that that uh, the person can connect with the person can relate to all right mm. now i am a i am a theologian i am a bible scholar i have my my masters of divinity in in pastoral ministries <laughs> no i i have studied two years worth of greek half a year worth of hebrew all right but when I, when I am meeting a non-believer, I am not trying to debate with her using scripture because she doesn't believe. I can quote all the scripture I want you. It, it means nothing to her. All right? We don't win people through debates. We don't win people through logical arguments. We yeah but what we want to give people is an encounter with god and that's planting a seed that's planting seeds to to people's hearts and people's souls uh before be, be, before circuit breaker before lockdown be, you know before covid 19 our you know uh our guys we have been on on the streets every Sunday we have we have three outreaches, yeah. Over the years we have we've grown to three three outreaches at least, yeah. Every Sunday we are there for the past since twenty eleven. All right, so it's like nine years, yeah. We've been we we've been doing that week in week out for nine years. Uh, we've been in Little India since twenty eleven. Twenty seventeen we started. Uh, Two other outreaches 
Yeah. Come on. <laughs> uh, so three outreaches. Yeah. Every week we are, we are, we are, we are, and we are just, and we don't, we don't shove the gospel down people's throats. We don't shove scripture down people's throat. Uh, but we offer them an encounter with God. Many of them come back. Some of them get saved. Uh, but what we, do, we are doing is this. Number one, we show that we, are care, we care. Number two, we show that we are committed. We are there every week. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and we are making a statement that we care. And, and we care because Jesus cares. And we are making a statement that Jesus is, Jesus is real because there is power. People are getting healed. People are getting blessed. People are getting breakthroughs in, in their health, in their, in their injuries. <laughs> week in, week out, Jesus is displaying power. Therefore, Jesus is real. And these are seeds planted in people's hearts and over the years we have impacted tens of thousands on the streets yeah, yeah come and on. it is evangelism is not a one time thing all right but as we as we sow seeds you know uh <laughs> there you know, God will bring people to do the watering and, and some of the seeds will germinate, take root and bear fruit. And so we know our place. Yep. And, and this, this is how, this is, this, this is how, yeah, this, this is how, this is how we, we allow people to encounter God, and and then that as their hearts open, you know, a number of them they will receive. Come on, because you cannot shove the gospel down people's throats; they will just reject it. Yeah. Patrick, thank you for sharing that. I I, I really love that. I mean, um, I want to talk a, a little bit, add on a little bit on that because I I, I think it's so important. Uh, there's so many key points I want to emphasize on. I think first of all, First Corinthians three, you know. Uh, it, it says some plant, some water, but God is the one to give an increase. Yeah. You know, and, and I think we need to recognize uh, this. Each of us has a very specific role in the kingdom of God. We are all one body, different parts. And maybe Sokolby Church, one of our strengths and one of our parts is actually uh, street outreach. You know, and, and in that sense, it's really releasing an encounter uh, of God to people. Either they get get an accurate word of knowledge, you know, get an encouraging prophetic word, or they get you on the streets, you know? And, and, and like what Patrick said, I think at the end of the day, our job is really to love the person that we meet on the streets, you know? We don't have an agenda, like at the start of the outreach, okay, guys, the quota for today is 10 people get safe or 10 people get healed. You know, we, we don't, you know? We, we just simply comes there and, and I, I, I'll, just, I'll be honest, uh, we are so blessed with really amazing outreach leader. Rain or shine, they are there. You know, they are always there. Every Sunday, they are always there. You know, setting up, loving the people. You know, and, and uh, uh, I think like we at the pastoral team are so blessed to have such amazing leaders who are committed. You know, and, and my point is, you see, we, we need to find out what's our role. And I think one of the danger in church right now is to partner with criticism. When we partner with criticism, there's always something negative to say. Oh, this outreach, you shouldn't do this way. That outreach, you shouldn't do that way. I mean, like, like, I love what Patrick says. It's like, okay, we do what we best know and we do to the best of our ability. And we are definitely open to partnership. You know, if you say that, oh, you want to do follow or what? Hey, I mean, like, you know, like, drop us a text, you know, we can discuss all this thing, you know. But, but if, you're, if, if Christian's role is to criticize and not be part of the solution, I, I don't think revival can come. You know, we need to understand we are one body, Jesus Christ the head, 
and in that body there are many different body parts and different function we need to find a function and in first Corinthians we talk about this some people function is to plant seeds you know keep planting seeds some people is to water the seeds they have great passion for discipleship following up great you know and and at the end of the day you know if you continue reading the verse it it, it says that you know those who plant those who sow are one one purpose come on you know and god will reward each one of them either the planter or the waterer according to their you know to what they did you know god will reward accordingly so so god sees and and my point is if you just share a gospel to someone and they don't get saved hey it is fine you know it is fine like god rewards you that's what the first say you know according to your effort you know but you need to know the people that got saved maybe they already heard the gospel 10 times means before you there were nine other people who preached the gospel to him and it is just maybe your your time then they receive they say okay maybe it's really time to receive the gospel it's maybe time you know so i'm just saying this like every people got saved there's a backstory. maybe they they attend a crusade before Maybe people shared before, you know, you might not be the first person, you know. So, so like people who water, you need to know someone was there before you to plant the seeds. So if you see a lot of people getting saved like every week, that's great. I mean, like I honor that. I bless your ministry. But at the same time, let's not forget there are people who has been planting seeds and they are the hidden heroes or the unsung heroes. Nobody knows, you know, nobody knows. But guess what? If you belong to this category whereby you're planting a lot of seed along the way and nobody knows, guess what? Heaven knows you. And I want to encourage you, God knows all these seeds you planted. And, 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 and God keeps a record of all these seeds. And God will reward you accordingly. You know? So, so, so I, I think this is a very good question because I think when we're talking on a revival, we need to come together as a body of Christ. You know? Sharing resources. You know? Lending strength. You know? I mean, I mean, we're talking about left hand and right hander. Uh, I mean, I'm a right hander, which means I use my left hand differently. And my left hand cannot call the right hand. Why are you not like me? Why are you doing it not like me? You know, and I think that's kind of what Patrick has been addressing. And I thought that was such a beautiful story. And Patrick, you know, answered it in, with so much clarity. And I'm just adding on a different perspective. I'm going to uh, get Jeff to add on if he wants to add on to that. And, and then we're going to uh, move on to ministry in, uh, in just a while. Um... Yeah, so when we talk about, uh, I'm, I'm just going to kind of talk about, um, even in the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 28, uh, this is uh, one of the most famous verses that we, we quote, like uh, Paul who went to Mars Hill in Athens and, says, and he looked at this statue that has no name, called the unknown God. So he decided to use the statue to preach that the unknown God is Jesus. Is there a good evangelistic plan? Like you go out in the streets, then there's this statue that has no name, then you <laughs> use the statue and kind of talk about, oh, that's the unknown God, his name is Yahweh, his name is Jesus. Doesn't sound like a very good evangelistic plan, right? <laughs> Doesn't sound like it, I won't do it. Uh, then he, and then you need to understand the, the uh, background and, and you need to understand the story behind the story which he quoted in Acts chapter 17 verse 28 for in him and, and he says one of the, just like one of your poets says for in him we live and move and have our beings and some of your, some of your poets says that we are his offspring now that quote is from Epimenides which is not he is a Greek uh, he's a seer, but he's not a Christian seer. He's, he, he, yeah, he's a Cretan seer. Yeah? So it's more towards the Greek gods. So, so you have this unknown statue, then you have no name, Paul decided you use it, then he quotes something from some Greek seer who his central worship is Zeus. So how does that work? Now, and then you need to understand the background story. And once you understand the background story, it will be very beautiful. So, uh, and, and now, when, when Paul uses, it's actually, matter of fact, it's a prayer by Ephemendides. When he prayed, I think about 500, uh, sorry, 430 BC, which is, there was actually a plague 
that actually happens in the atoms. Now, what happened was there is uh, now why does this happen? Uh, the the now that the ruler for at one time for atoms is this. Uh, the, this man by the name of the king, well, the, this man by the name of, okay, it sounds like Transformer, so uh, his name is Megacles, not Megatron, but Megacles. Okay, Megacles has actually negotiated with the Cylons. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, it's some sci fi movie, like, <laughs> yeah, not, not Optimus Prime, but like, uh, and, and so to, for them to surrender so that he'll spare their lives. But once the Cylons surrender, they, he actually killed every single one of them. And it was a massacre. And he lied. It was a massacre. And so what happened was when, during the plague in Athens, when it happens, they believed that it was because of this incident, this massacre, that Megacles, yeah, sounds like a Transformer episode, like Megacles did, and therefore we are reaping the, it, it was like a, it, it's a pandemic. It's just like now, it's like, oh, and, and they decided to, the funny thing is there are more statues than people, some have said, in Marcel, and so they decided to sacrifice to every one of the gods, because you don't know which one you have offended. They sacrificed to every single one of their gods, and then none, the plague didn't stop. So they decided to go to this woman in a cave and uh, some kind of seer and she say, told them to the wise men of Athens they said, there is an unknown god that you don't know about. And then the, the, the guys in Athens was like, what is his name? Then he, she said, like, it, well, if I know the name, it won't be unknown. <laughs> and so, but she said, go and look for Epimenides and he will tell you what to do. So these guys went to Epimenides. Epimenides actually went to Athens, to Marcia, and realized, oh, the plague was so bad, and decided to help them. But the problem is they don't know which god. And he actually says the next morning, he put uh, a, a number of black sheep and a number of white sheep. The white sheep represents the god of light, the black sheep represents the god of darkness. And so, and allowed them to run free. And wherever these white sheep may lie down there, uh, that will be the place where that will be the god that we offended. Somehow these white sheep went to lie down in this plain place, and then, well, then, what happened was that place. It says that's it. That is a place of the unknown god, and they erected the statue. It, and he prayed this prayer. I'll just kind of like um, paraphrase it. Uh, to the unknown god who we are offended, please forgive us. Because we know in you we live and move and have our beings. So he realized that the God that we live and move and have our beings, that we have offended, please forgive us, and sacrifice the sheep. Guess what? The next day, the, the plague actually stops. The plague actually stops. Now, you have to understand, if a plague stops, that's definitely God. But they don't know which God. And so then when Paul comes and saw... The statue of the unknown god, he, he, when he quoted that, there is some historical things to, to, to the phrase, in him we live and move and have our beings, because to the, to, to the people in Marcia, to the people in Athens, there is every god you can touch and every god you can destroy. But this god, this god is the one, he is the main god, he is the god that actually stopped the plague, you can't touch this god. And when Paul went there and he is telling them the god that stopped the plague, wasn't unknown God and his name is Yahweh, his name is Jesus. And he uses that. So that means for us, why right, we need to go into the place and start to I, I you see I'm a missionary at heart. And I like it when uh, I have some friends in Australia, uh, uh, Jenny and uh, uh, and, and when, when they they, when they learn how to speak to new age people, when they learn to use to the Jews, to, to the Jews, I become like a Jew, to the foolish, I become like a foolish, to the, to the wise, I become like a wise, so that can be win some. And so, they, you see, why did Paul say that? Because we are not in a ministry of condemnation. A ministry of condemnation requires one to be above and one to be, that is below so that I can condemn. Reconciliation requires us to go down to the level and say, hey, be reconciled to God. 
Reconciliation is harder though because it requires us to bring ourselves to this place where we understand them and says, you know the God that you worship that has been answering your prayer, that is Jesus. We need to come down to this place where to speak the common language and yet not dilute the message. Now, there's a rule to contextualization. If you contextualize the gospel to a point where at the end people don't recognize it's Jesus, that something is wrong with the way you're contextualizing it. That's what we call contextualization. Yeah? And at the end of the goal uh, of contextualization is people encounter Jesus through the culture, through their understanding. And what Paul did was beautiful. The God that stopped the whole plague and saved your whole city, his name, I'm here to tell you the name. Wow, that is beautiful. And how many times have we, do you know that there's so many things in, 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 that, 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 that there are so many culture keys that is in, in the world that if you go into tribes, you realize that they worship one God and his name is Yah, who baptized us, who, mar who, baptized, uh, who, who married us many years ago from fire from heaven. That is in Burma, though. Who this tribe who worships the God whose name is Yah. <laughs> yeah. And, and see, there are so many things that who came, who baptized us with fire, what, wow, guess what, that's Pentecost though, that's Pentecost, you know, that's, that's amazing, and so, if we only deep, look deep enough, and realize that God, has put keys in every culture, every tribe, and every tongue, and if we speak in the common language, and if we speak in their language, there is something beautiful there, that as we unlock, the whole tribe will be saved, I can tell you stories after stories after stories of, of, of keys like this, that, that whether it's language or whatever it is, that one word and one language unlocks everything. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sometimes even the, the prophetic in a way, like I, I, I wouldn't know that if I was praying for this, uh, there's this guy that I, you know, I was with Georgian. I don't know whether you know Georgian Benoff. Like, uh, and so we went to, uh, we, we, we were in Bangkok and we were like, we were went to this street where there was transversite and there was prostitution going on. And what we did was this, guitar, jimbe, saxophone, we go there and we did a love celebration. Yeah, of course, the, the transfers that come, oh, I also need love, give me some love. <laughs> it's okay, but no, we are giving a different kind of love. And say, what kind of love? It's very simple. So we, we worship, and the funny thing was, we did a fire tunnel in the middle of the street in Bangkok, two sides. And <laughs> so if you know Jordan, like, he will, and all these transfer sites and all these prostitutes will just go into the tunnel and they were like, oh, and people, we were like, yeah, shaka, pray, pray for them, and just worshipping, and just releasing presence over them. You know, at the end of the night, there were, there were three transverse sites that sat down, and they said, I don't know why, but as I keep going into the tunnel, I came out, I feel more free, I feel so happy, I don't know what the, what is this joy that I'm feeling, and you know what? The gospel was preached, because they tasted something, so that they saw that God is good. How many times we try to tell people to see that God is good without allowing them to taste that He is good? Wow, I, I, I'm telling you, there's so many things. It doesn't need to be a, a track. The world needs to reach you, not read a track. The world needs to read your life, and your life tells the story of Jesus rather than a track that tells about Jesus. Why? So the... The people can throw the track on the floor, but they cannot throw your testimony down on the floor because what is heard has the power to recreate itself, and that's the power of testimony. It's prophetic. So I would like to leave that to you. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good, Jeff. I'm just kind of trying to summarize because I, I feel like this ending point um, is very important because, uh, I mean, people who have been with following Soap uh, for a while, you will know that Soap Liberty is a very uh, unique church, you know, uh, I think we, we one, of, one of our greatest strength is not just the supernatural, but a lot in creativity in how we present the gospel, how we evangelize, how we minister. We have a lot of creativity, like, you know. And, and, and 
I mean, we are not just the only creative church. Let's be honest that. Okay, there are many other ministry um, or churches that does creative uh, ministry or evangelism. You know? And, and I just want to end off by saying this. Let's not be so quick to judge people's ministry just because you, you, it doesn't fit your paradigm. You know? Because it, 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 is, it is almost like, like you don't know how to cook. The only thing you know how to cook is instant noodle. And you're criticizing how the chef is cooking your steak. <laughs> you see the contrast? You know? It, it's, like, it's like, I've never got anyone safe, but I'm criticizing how you evangelize. Uh, I, I have never seen a miracle, but I'm criticizing how you heal the sick or how you pray for the sick. I have never given a prophetic word or I've never given a word of knowledge, but I'm criticizing how you prophesy. You know, so, so, so I like, like here my heart, I, I, I think my, my heart uh, to end off this tonight is let's not be so quick to jump and say this ministry is wrong, that church is wrong. Like, do you know the pastor's heart? Do you know the heart behind the outreach? You know, like, like, like I, 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 I can think of some, some of my great friends doing interesting ministry. Like, I have a friend in Hong Kong that go to the Red Light District. His name is Daniel Black. And on, all he does is just give roses and, and tell them that Jesus loves them. And, and, and people think like, that doesn't change the world. That doesn't get people saved. You know, but, but he got so many amazing story and testimony that, that many people don't hear. Like, pe- like, like some of the mama son, you know, the, the hate masseuse, you know, got saved, got water baptized, you know, like, like I know, like even like, um, like uh, Ken and Jenny, they, they have a very interesting ministry that I really uh, respect. And, and like, I mean, if you hear my, my story about what I do at a Taiwan night market, I was also like inspired by what they do. You know, and, and of course, the, the list goes on. There's so many different creative outreaches uh, to certain people's group, maybe to the new age, to the red light district, to the orphans, you know, etc. You know, they, they might be different. They might not fit your paradigm, but let's not be so quick uh, to jump in and say, this is wrong. You should do it this way. You know, like, 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 like what Patrick shared, like how someone who is not even like, a professional teaching a professional <laughs> in that sense in a context you know i i, I think i think I, but i mean like, it's kind of common for us we, we probably meet some people along the way but but i think my heart is like let's 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 put love as a center stage and let's not be so quick to to judge people's ministry like really hear their heart connect with them yeah all right so but we we do want to kind of move on to ministry ministry time i i um uh, but before that, uh, it, this is the time to uh, pray for uh, our offering and tithe. So if you are from uh, Sokol BT Church, you know, uh, if you want to give your offering and tithe, you know, feel free to you know, uh, scan the QR code that we are going to flash up right now. And you can give your offering and tithe through that. You know, uh, for those people who are overseas, uh, you can give through PayPal. You know? But I do also want to emphasize that, you know, uh, if you're not from Soko Bleedy Church, you know, please keep your tie to your local church. But if you want to sow above and beyond what we do through our online session and our outreaches, uh, you may do so. We'll be really uh, blessed and honored to receive uh, the blessing from you. All right, uh, Jeff, can I get you to, to pray? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Bless those who give in the name of Jesus. That when we give, we give to your kingdom. When we give, we're giving because there's a harvest that is coming. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord. When we give, Lord, we are giving unto the Lord. And it's part of worship. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We bless you. And bless those who give in the name of Jesus. May you open the doors, Lord. For those of you who are in crisis, in financial crisis, I'm just going to pray right now in the name of Jesus. If there's a financial need, I'm just going to release right now in the name of Jesus. We just speak life and abundance in the name of Jesus. May God open unusual doors. I'm talking about unusual doors. And doors that were given up, you will lose hope. And next week, I don't know why I say that, but there is going to be a week that, uh, that that's going to be like uh, unusual doors that's going to be reopened. So 
I just want to say that out. And I usually don't say, I never say all these things uh, usually because I'm the, not you, the one that's praying for the offering usually. <laughs> <laughs> so Lord, we thank you, Lord. Uh, in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Right now.